You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you will hear us in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is not and, as um, simple you know, I, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many you know, more doors. The show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. Ah, mm, The first taste of rare bourbon you finally got your hands on. That's nice. At Caskers.com, we make this experience easy. Caskers is a one-stop spirit curator with an impressive selection of exclusive sought-after rare and household names in the realm of premium spirits and champagne. Discover the top flavors of the year now by going to caskers.com and using code WELCOME10 for $10 off your first purchase. Get $10 off your first purchase with code WELCOME10 at caskers.com. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore data. Well, we're going to spend today, at the very least, talking about this Joe Barry situation. Hopefully today isn't like yesterday, where I do all this stuff, and then by the time you hear this, we already have a new defensive coordinator. By the way, again, apologize for not getting that podcast out a little sooner. I could have at least had a podcast out for a couple hours before the guy got fired, but anyways. Um, I do want to start, though, before we get there on something. I, you know, Clayton had sent this to me, and I'd seen it around, and I I guess I didn't pick up on the hint. (laughs) I just thought it was a nice little thing that happened until I saw somebody um, reposted it with a caption. But apparently there's some speculation that um, Jair Alexander could be done. So this all stems from a, um, and by the way, Clayton, I have no idea if that's what your intention was. I'm just saying, like, I I saw that people keep posting it, and I just, I didn't think anything of it until somebody put the caption that he may be gone. But that's all stemming from an Instagram post from Jair Alexander um, that says, Thank you, God. Thank you, Lambo, for six years. Thank you to those who showed love throughout my journey. Again, that just, to me, I mean, it's pretty obvious where I stand on this issue based on the fact that I read that and it never triggered anything in my brain. (laughs) It wasn't until somebody put the, the heading on that was something to the effect of, you know, is he saying goodbye to Packers fans? Now I'll, I'll say this, given what a weird situation it's been, especially with Jair and some of the other stuff, I, I I won't rule anything out. I, I ruled out some stuff before, and then obviously a bunch of drama erupted and it's like, okay, maybe something is going on. But aside from that little piece in the back of my brain, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stick with the assumption that this is very simply him saying thank you for another year. And there's quite a few reasons for that. Number one, again, if we assume, if we remove the fact that a lot of people have been talking about Jair's done, would anybody have read this message with any other eyes other than he's just saying thank you? I don't think so. I think some people have been saying they think he's done after this year and it's all over and all that stuff. And so when they read that, this was sort of a confirmation bias thing. And I think if it wasn't for that presupposed bias already built into certain people, they would never have even read it that way. Case in point, me. I, I, un, under no circumstances have I thought that Jair would be leaving. So when I read this, it just was saying, thank you, God. Thank you, Lambo." It's been a great six years. He didn't say it's been a great six years, but thank you for six years. Thanks to those who showed love throughout my journey. I, I, I mean, obviously, first of all, the, you know, an end of a season is an emotional thing. I've, I've been over here basically weeping and whining this whole time about, oh man, the season's over and thank you guys so much for sticking with me and all that stuff. I'm not saying goodbye. In fact, I'm, I'll talk to you today and tomorrow and the next day after that. It's just a, it's just a, a, a postmortem. It's a, you know, whatever. Beyond that, another issue that I have with it would be the assumption that Jair Alexander already knows he's gone. How would he know that? He's already worked that out with the team? Did he know that during the season and they just let him play and it's been, I doubt the team would tell him during the season. Did they tell him immediately after the season? Because remember, they just met on Monday. When, when was this even posted? On Monday or Tuesday? 
So they met with, with, and that was when they met the coaches. I don't even know if the coaches met with the players at all. But I, I think he does before they leave. So maybe that was like on, maybe that was on Sunday and, and during just the very quick little meeting, which usually you don't say, hey, by the way, you're out of here. It's just kind of a quick going over like the season and talking about stuff. So they had a conversation and they were like, oh, by the way, we're, we're trading you because we think you're a piece of crap. And he's like, okay, I understand. And like, that's, that's where, like, just make that part of it make sense to me. How does Jair know that he's leaving? Is he saying goodbye because he's going to force his way off the team? Why would he do that? Why would he force his way off the team? Why would he force a trade? If he's not forcing it, that means the team is kicking him off the, 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 the team, which again, explain that part to me. When did they tell him this? In, in addition to that, I would assume there'd be some... Back, like, if the team has made a decision like this, Jair would have told players, the entire organization would know, this would have leaked to Ian Rappaport by now. I haven't heard a single thing about it. There is no way the organization made a, a decision. Like, they, I mean, they made a decision with Joe Barry, we found out in 30 seconds from Ian Rappaport. So they made a decision, like, three, four days ago about Jair Alexander, one of the most massive things that's going to happen this entire year, moving on from a superstar cornerback because apparently they don't like him. The team is aware, Jair is aware, which means most of his teammates are going to be aware, and nothing is leaked to anyone? That seems surprising to me. But then there's obviously the biggest problem is that is we just paid him. There is no financial way in the universe that the Packers can move on from him. They would have to pay nearly $30 million to trade Jair. It would cost them $27.456 million just to move on. And, wh- and why again? Why are we moving on from Jair Alexander? He made a mistake. He got a one-game suspension. They've had great conversations ever since. He bounced back with a great attitude and has been playing really well. They're moving on with a new defensive coordinator, so any friction that may, have been, may or may not have been going on there, all that's done with, but it's still such a, a, an absolute matter of contention that they have to spend $27.5 million just to get Jair Alexander out of the building. What are we talking about here? Like, what? I, I, none of this makes any sense whatsoever. Zero. Nada. All right, so should we move on to the, uh, the order of the day? Let's also start with some, some interesting news on that front as well. So Joe Barry was is not going to be brought back. I, you know, titled it fired because it's more salacious. I don't know if he was fired or just not brought back because I don't know his contract situation. It sounds like he may have been fired. There is talk, however, that he could be brought back in some capacity. I can't help but think that that is beyond speculation. Let, let, me, let me give you an idea of how something like this could potentially get reported. And then I'll explain why I feel the need to overanalyze it. Let's pretend you're Ian Rappaport. Okay, I'm just going to keep using him. I don't know who, Tom Pelissero, I think, broke the one. Don't give a crap. Ian Rappaport. You find out Joe Barry's getting fired, right? You're talking to you're talking straight to Matt LaFleur. Like, hey, Matt, what's going on? It's Ian Rappaport. Is it true? Yeah, yeah, it's true. We let him go. He's really close with you, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're best of friends. Really, really hard. Hate to see him go. Was well, it possible you could bring him back on some capacity and something else, you know? Any other role, maybe not as DC? Yeah, I mean, anything's possible. Anything's on the table. You never know. Runs to Twitter and types out, could be brought back in some capacity. Here's the reason why I think that that makes more sense than the fact that the, the Packers are actually actively trying to find ways to keep him. Keep him to do what? To do what? Is he going to be uh, assisting the defensive coordinator? In what capacity? Who's the defensive coordinator? What scheme are they running? How can Joe Barry help him? Does the defensive coordinator want Joe Barry there? So just to be clear, this isn't some like anti-Joe Barry, he needs to be out of the building at all costs. I really don't care if he comes back in some capacity. I, 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 I mean, you want to bring him back as the linebackers coach if he's willing? I don't freaking care. It'd be fantastic. I'd love to have him as the linebackers coach. But I'm assuming he's not looking for a linebackers coach position. I don't know how much better than that he's going to get, but certainly not run game coordinator. I don't know, some kind of a consultant, maybe, but th- th- that's not a Matt LaFleur question. Unless he's going to be working directly with Matt LaFleur as some kind of a offensive game plan assistant or some kind of weird thing where he helps defensively analyze a team so that Matt LaFleur can, you know, but, but that's not a thing. Are you actually going to like give him some kind of a promotion to 
assistant head coach. And if that was the plan, why would you do this whole thing where you say goodbye and thank him for his service? If you were planning to promote, you're not planning to promote him. So the bottom line is it's possible he could come back just like it's possible anybody else can either come or go. But that will be and needs to be completely at the discretion of the new defensive coordinator and what they want to do. If So, for example, if you're bringing in, let's say Staley, which would be awful and I don't think that's going to happen, I think Joe Barry could be an asset. Now, I don't think Joe Barry is a very good play caller, but that doesn't mean he's not very intelligent when it comes to the scheme and couldn't help kind of figure some things out. And if Staley was interested in that, maybe he could retain his services as the passing game coordinator or the assistant assistant defensive coordinator. I don't freaking know. Who cares what the title is? Maybe. But we don't know who the defensive coordinator is. So how could we possibly know how he could help the defensive coordinator? And in what capacity? The, 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 again, it's, it's another situation like Jair where, tell me what could have happened within 30 minutes of him getting fired. Like, what, what was the conversation that happened? So we're going to let you go. But what? What happened? What, what was the conversation? What? We're going to do what? We're letting you go, but fill in the blank. And again, if it's just, you know, if there's any way, then, you know, whatever, then that's a nothing comment. So the bottom line is, at best, this is a nothing statement that says it's not impossible that somebody might want to bring in Joe Barry for a lesser capacity if Joe Barry would even want to take that job. Again, I doubt he's going to get a defensive coordinator job, but it's, it's just, it just, there's, n- there's nothing here. Nothing. Who's the defensive coordinator and why are they keeping Joe Barry? Can't answer that, right? Okay, so then there's nothing to talk about here. And as far as like Matt LaFleur just usurping the defensive coordinator and forcing Joe Barry down the next defensive coordinator's throat, that would be the worst possible decision you could ever make, number one. And number two, again, if that was the case, I don't think they would have done this whole firing thing. You can move him to that position now and then just tell the defensive coordinator that, you know, coming in here, it is a, you know, you have decisions to make over your personnel, but you have to keep this person, which again would be really stupid and probably why they didn't do it. But again, it's like you fired the guy. So why are we talking about we need to keep him? If you need to keep him, then just keep him. Well, no, we actually decided that he wasn't very good and we don't want him here. You, you, do you see why this whole story makes no sense to me? None of this makes any sense. And considering how much complete garbage gets flown around and speculation and fake reports and everything else, it just makes infinitely more sense that this is, this is at best a massive misunderstanding, misquote, twist of reality than the Packers legitimately have plans for Joe Barry to stay in the building. It just makes zero sense to me. So anyways, with all that said... I do want to go through a little bit, as I did uh, yesterday, about some of the um, some of the candidates. And I, th- for me, anyways, the best place to start is to start with the guys that seem to have the most NFL interest. the The best defensive coordinators or potential defensive coordinators out there usually are not a secret. So, more than likely, whoever that person is that has the most buzz. It's unlikely that there have been um, scores of interviews taking place, and this person hasn't been talked to yet. The list, as of my latest understanding, is Chris Harris, defensive pass game coordinator for the Titans, Terrell Williams, assistant head coach defensive lineman for the the Titans, Uh, Shane Bowen, former defensive coordinator of the Titans, Jiro Evero, defensive coordinator for the Panthers. Obviously, we all know he's in high demand, unlikely to come to Green Bay. I mean, high demand as a head coach, much less defensive coordinator. Chris Hewitt, defensive pass game coordinator for the Ravens. Marquand Manuel, safeties coach for the Jets. Wink Martindale, former DC of the Giants. Demarcus Covington, defensive line coach for the Patriots. Michael Hodges, linebackers coach for the Saints. Uh, Tem Lukabu, offensive line coach for the Panthers. Christian Parker, defensive backs coach for the Broncos. Derek Ainsley, defensive coordinator for the Chargers. Bobby Babich, linebackers coach for the Bills. Anthony... Campanile, linebackers coach for the Dolphins. Denard Wilson, DB's coach for the Ravens. Mike Caldwell, former DC Jaguars. Ron Rivera, former head coach for the Commanders. Now, the funny part about that list is there's an article here by uh, Wendell Ferreira, and I'm, in no way am I picking on him, but it's, it's just funny to me because most of the really big names are not on that list. A lot of the names that people are talking about, like Brandon Staley. How many interviews? Mike Vrabel. 
first of all, dude is not going to get defensive coordinator interviews because he's getting head coaching inter- interviews. But has he had a DC interview? No. Leslie Frazier, former Minnesota Vikings head coach. Was he on that list? No. Mike Zimmer, former Minnesota Vikings head coach. No. Jim Leonard. Anything? No. How about Al Harris? Nope. So while I do want to pick some of the names off this list and and a bunch of other lists to kind of grow the current list, again, I do want to start here because this is what the NFL is telling us. These are the guys in the direction that they want to go. And one of them, Ryan Nielsen, who is on the list, has already been hired by the Jacksonville Jaguars. Now, Ryan Nielsen, you may notice, was not on anybody's list. It's not Brandon Staley. It's not Mike Zimmer. It's not Wink Martindale, who is on the list, but still. It's not one of the big names. And the reason that's important to point out, I mean, we could just look at it and say, well, that's just incompetence by a a, a stupid, terrible Jaguars team. Okay, maybe. Or maybe our criteria for what makes a good defensive coordinator is off. And the the biggest problem that we're going to have with this is that whatever the criteria is, we don't have access to it. We just we just don't. There's so much information that's just hidden out there that has passed through the grapevine that I just do not have access to. And so for that reason, we're going to start with this list. Why don't we take a break first? We'll come back and start digging through some of these uh, these coaching guys. There's actually one more name I do need to add to this list that did do an interview that I was able to find, but uh, we'll talk about that on the other side. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you will hear us in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. And that is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is and not uh, as simple you know, I, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many you know, more doors. The show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo Concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price. price Priceline. Ah, mmm. The first taste of rare bourbon you finally got your hands on. That's nice. At Caskers.com. We make this experience easy. Caskers is a one-stop spirit curator with an impressive selection of exclusive sought-after rare and household names in the realm of premium spirits and champagne. Discover the top flavors of the year now by going to caskers.com and using code WELCOME10 for $10 off your first purchase. Get $10 off your first purchase with code WELCOME10 at caskers.com. So I don't know if we're going to be able to get through all of these guys, but I do want to go through especially some of the the lesser-known names One of the ones I want to start with is Gerald Alexander, kind of an interesting guy because I think he checks a lot of boxes, at least my boxes, maybe not your boxes. But um, two of the two of the boxes that he checks are he's young and he's a former player. Gerald Alexander played at first for the Detroit Lions 2007, 2008. He also played for the Jaguars, the Panthers, the Dolphins and the Jets. He started getting into coaching just very shortly after that. 2011, he was with the Jets. 2013, he got his first job as an undergrad assistant at Arkansas State, became a grad assistant at Washington in 2014, was an intern for the Titans in 2015, intern for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in 2016, also uh, Indiana State defensive backs coach in 2015. He was a defensive backs coach for Montana State in 2016. Then went to Cal and was their defensive backs, uh, yeah, defensive backs coach from 2017 to 2019. He cracked into the NFL in 2020. So first of all, he's very young. He's 39 years old. Second of all, he just got his first job in 2020 
in the NFL. I mean, he, he was an intern with Tampa in 2016, but his first actual coaching job in 2020, despite very limited DB experience. By the way, he was a former safety, if you couldn't tell. That, that's why he's getting all the DB jobs. He was there for two years and then went to uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers in 2020 and 2023 as their assistant defensive backs coach. And again, is now getting defensive coordinator calls. So this checks every single box. Former player, very young, very fast mover, right? He just got into the NFL and they're already talking about him being a DC. That doesn't mean he's going to be one. It's very possible that he's not quite ready for that yet. He's going to get some other calls for some other for some other things, but I find this to be extremely impressive. The other positive is, do you know who the defensive coordinator was in Miami in 2020? It's Brian Flores. Now, there was a lot of tumultuous stuff going on in Miami with Brian Flores and all kinds of accusations and all kinds of crazy stuff. But all that aside, I think Brian Flores is generally regarded as a very um, impressive defensive coordinator and, and runs a much more aggressive and coveted NFL defensive scheme. And I mean, let's be honest, I mean, Packer fans would love to run more of a Flores type of a, of a defense. I mean, it's, you know, heavy blitz, man coverage, you know, former Patriots, you know, eliminate the, the, the opponent's best assets type of a defensive court. Like it just, it would check most Packer fans boxes just down the line. And then after that, he goes to the Pittsburgh Steelers, you know, and, and it's another, you know, sort of DB heavy Kind of, I mean, I, I think for both of them, you're looking at an upgrade at safety, especially if you've got a, a, a former safety coming in as a defensive coordinator. You can expect the Packers to be aggressive in finding some really talented safeties and or potentially, if they roll with, with Savage, maybe just a big jump in, uh, in performance. Either way would be fine with me. But either way, I, I, I think he's, he's been with some really good teams. There's a couple other things that I wanted to highlight, Re- really funny aspect of this. Gerald Alexander is actually very active on Twitter. He has 20,000 followers, which is pretty rare for just a, you know, assistant coach. But if you look, he's on here constantly. His, his latest post, you maybe see, I saw I put this, it says, say no to cheese. So I was like, okay, I guess he's not coming to Green Bay. That was within the last 24 hours. But he's constantly commenting on, on stuff as well. I mean, if, if this is a guy that's just you know, dying to like start a YouTube channel or something. I mean, just reading through his last couple of tweets, what Dan Campbell has done is unprecedented. What he has done is some heavy, you know what, lifting to change the culture mindset of an organization. Salute. Below that, he says 26 looks different. Below that, the strategic component to play calling to anticipate the personality of the opposing play caller is one of the dopest things about ball. It's just, I don't know. He says, great screen call versus blitz zero. Below that, this is January 21st. Double dip situation is devastating. Hell, it sucks when you get it in Madden, let alone in a real life game. The score right before halftime and they get it back after after a critical two minute score there for Tampa. I wonder if he commented on the Packers game. I mean, the guy's just on here talking ball, like just as a fan. He says, it's a weapon when you're not afraid to zero out on the grass on a passing down. He says, quote, lateral plays are trick plays, unquote. Below that, he says the responsibility, he's responding to Lewis Riddick, and he says the responsibility then falls on pass catchers, as you know. This is where they truly miss Mark Andrews. When it becomes single high, five-man rush, he was normally the consistent winner based on matchup. Below that, he says Kyle Van Noy, ability to stand up and be a rusher and drop a nickel, third down personnel, allows Baltimore to play their personnel similar to a dime, three defensive line, two linebacker package. Did the same for us in Miami in 2020. (laughs) <laughs> so he's he's just commenting as a fan but also oh by the way he did that for us back in the day you know when i was there either as a coach slash player or whatever and then there's a, a wait and this this is all on january 20th so this is you know during the packers game or around that time uh he says i love talking football sorry for the flooding below that he says there's no scheme adjustment for gt or ct scheme as i've said to players i've coached when we see it. You've got to kick effing A at the point of attack. GT is guard tackle, CT is center tackle. Below that, he says, here's another thing I want you casual football watchers to pay attention to. GT or CT counter schemes. What is it? So he's out here just teaching people stuff. I mean, this is a great follow, period. What is it? Two offensive linemen pulling to the front side of a run play, providing one-on-one block because they will keep an eligible person to block behind the run play. 
He goes on to say, GT or CT schemes are based on defensive front. Most two-level defenders are responsible and aligned on the eligible. So when you block with the eligible and pull two linemen, you get a two-on-one backside and then blah, 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 blah. blah. I don't freaking know what's going on here. I don't know. I just, I, I kind of dig it a little bit. But here's the final thing I want to say about him. Obviously, we're not going to get through too many people. I'm, I'm just, I'm getting really excited about Gerald Alexander here. This is an article from Dolphins Talk. Uh, written on February 10th, 2020. Breaking news, Dolphins fire defensive backs coach Gerald Alexander. And you think, well, this is this is where everything starts to suck. Not at all. The article starts, Alexander joined the Dolphins in 2020 and has been their defensive backs coach for the last two seasons as well, and was one of the most popular on the defensive staff among the media and fan base. Excuse me, on the Dolphins staff, not the defensive staff. He is regarded in league circles as an up-and-coming coach who many believe could be a defensive coordinator and head coach someday. He interviewed for the Jacksonville Jaguars defensive coordinator position earlier this week, but he didn't get the job, as reports are saying Mike Caldwell has landed that job, even though it hasn't been formally announced yet. So he was getting DC interview or yeah, DC interviews in 2020. Uh, excuse me, 2022. So after his first stint with Miami, two years. In the NFL, as a DB coach, he's already getting calls as a potential defensive coordinator. It says, when Brian Flores sued the NFL and the Dolphins, Alexander was very public in his praise of the former Dolphins coach, putting up on Twitter the following. He's, this is what he said on Twitter. I already had a lot of respect for Brian Flores before today. Today confirmed he's one of the best leaders I've ever been around. Goes on to say, one would think that Stant didn't sit well with the higher-ups who are in Miami living through the league investigation and lawsuit. Also, Gerald's wife put up this tweet below on Wednesday. She has since taken the tweet down that had people questioning who was calling plays on defense this past season in Miami. She said, when the defense got better this season, did you notice G.A., Gerald Alexander, wasn't on the sideline anymore? His role changed for the better of the defense, but people think it was Flo, as in Flores. So, the wife of Gerald Alexander said that Gerald Alexander was given a new job, was put up in the booth, and that's when the defense started to improve, and they gave the credit to Flores when really it should have gone to Gerald Alexander. So again, I mean, I, the, the guy checks all my boxes. Young up-and-comer that everybody's really excited about, people really like. Is Does he have enough experience? I don't know. But worth keeping an eye on. At the very least, would be worth interviewing for one of the lesser jobs. I mean, if, if he's, I mean, right now he's an assistant DB coach for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Bring him in to be your DB coach slash pass game coordinator. Unless there's somebody currently on staff that you just can't, can't possibly part with. I, I mean, then in, in that case, you know, by all means, please. Um, I'm just going to more or less remove Mar uh, Wink Martindale from this, partially because we've already talked about Wink Martindale his experience. Um, I think he's a talented guy, but I, I don't think he's really a fit. I don't know that he's really a fit anywhere, but I don't think the Packers of all teams would be interested in going in that direction. I mean, the fact that Wink Martindale was relieved of duty, well, he left his last two jobs in what seemed to be a not super great manner, with the last one being him storming off, going down to uh, give himself a vacation and not even respond to the calls of his team. I'm sorry, but I just, you know, I don't think that's going to be a thing. Um, again, Evero, obviously at the top of everybody's list, but very unlikely to be a DC for the Green Bay Packers or probably anyone else. And then Ryan Nielsen has already been hired away. Already talked uh, pretty extensively about Marquan Manuel. I think Manuel, as I've said, makes the absolute most sense. I mean, he is a former defensive coordinator, which is going to be important for a offensive head coach. He has experience with Matt LaFleur on his staff. Um, he works under uh, Sala right now, which obviously is a very good defense and a very good defensive coordinator, and it's probably a, a scheme that the Packers would be interested in. And of course, Robert Sala is very, very good friends, pro possibly best friends with uh, Matt LaFleur. All of those things, I think, point in the direction of, at the very least, garnering an interview. I, I would I would guess he's probably top of the list for an interview. And if, if you ask me today who will be the defensive coordinator of the Green Bay Packers, I would probably say Marquan Manuel. But again, we've already kind of covered Marquan Manuel, former player, former Packer, knows LaFleur, all that stuff. By the way, if you haven't heard me talk about these coaches, like for example, the guys we're going to talk about next, um, 
do your best to try to go back and find them. I, I, I can try to look up and see if I can find where they were if you want to reach out and ask me. I just don't want to repeat myself because I went kind of in depth on, on a lot of these guys. But w- one of the days when I was looking into this, what I went over in, in some detail was the, um, the Ravens coaching staff. So, for example, Anthony Weaver is the assistant head coach slash defensive line coach. Now, he, he would be sort of top of the line, not necessarily because I think he's, you know, or because I know he's better than anybody else, but just because he's at the sort of top of the list, right? You got your defensive coordinator, Mike McDonald, and then under him is the assistant head coach, defensive line coach. And, and you know, you, again, you got a, this long line of, of things are trying to hold on to this guy. So that's somebody to keep an eye on. Um, in addition to that, one of the guys that is on this list that we've already talked about is Chris Hewitt. I wish I could remember which ones I liked the most, but I can't remember. I'm sure somebody else would remember, but uh, Chris Hewitt would be a name. Uh, Zachary Orr, I think, is a really interesting name. He's the inside linebackers coach. Chuck Smith is the outside linebackers coach. We're missing, uh, where is he? Oh, Denard Wilson, defensive backs coach. So Denard Wilson and Chris Hewitt are the two guys that have had interviews so far. So I would pay special attention to those two guys. But again, there's a lot of names on this coaching staff, a lot of former players, a lot of guys with a good amount of, I mean, Chris Hewitt looks really young. He's got 12 years of experience. Zach Orr, seven years. Denard Wilson, 12 years. Anthony Weaver, 12 years. So I'm not going to go over all these guys because again, I already did. Maybe, you know, depending on how long this drags on or or if there isn't a official interview, we can kind of dive back into it. But um Again, I'm I'm a big fan of pretty much all of them. I don't remember who I settled on, if I even settled on anyone as as my favorite of the group. But um, obviously, the Ravens have a really talented staff, and uh, I just like that a lot of them are are young former player types, aggressive type defense, just just a violent. They're just a violent unit, and I dig it. And and just you know, from a cultural standpoint, it would be nice to instill that. So I think we've whittled down the list quite a bit here. Why don't we take a uh, our final break? We've got Chris Harris. Terrell Williams, Shane Bowen, Demarcus Covington, Michael Hodges, Tam Lukabu, Christian Parker, Derek Ainsley, Bobby Babich, Anthony Campanile, Mike Caldwell, and Ron Rivera to go into next. And I'll do my best to try to go through as many of these as I possibly can so we, we at least get the basics of who these guys are. Because I, I, my goal is when an announcement is made, we've at least touched on it. But we will take a break. We'll be right back. So why don't we start with Ron Rivera? That's obviously the biggest name. A lot of people are all in on Ron Rivera, and I understand the appeal of it. I think there's quite a few people, and and I think I was one of them for at least a while, um, that was really big on the concept of, you know, there's there's really good DCs who just aren't necessarily, and this doesn't necessarily apply to Ron Rivera, but just stick with me, who aren't necessarily good head coaches. And then, you know, when it doesn't work out as a head coach, they go back to a DC and that's when you can snag them. Like that's the one opportunity you get to get a proven defensive coordinator that also doesn't have a job. Because otherwise, if he's really good at his job, how are you going to get him? The only other way is sort of like, you know, in in, in a Jiro Evero thing where there's coaching overhaul and maybe they're not going to stick around or something. But look, I'll, I'll keep it real simple with Ron Rivera. I'm not a big fan of this because he has not been a defensive coordinator since 2010. And you can say, well, he's still been running defenses and all that stuff. No, 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 no. Head coach and defensive coordinator are different jobs. And the fact of the matter is he was a defensive coordinator for a lot less time than he was a head coach. I think some guys, look at the Lions, are actually better coaches than they are coordinators. You know, it, and I, I think a, a false thing that a lot of people think, and I think I've even said it on the podcast, is you, you kind of look at it as, as jobs that get harder and harder and harder. And there's an area where you're really good, and then you go too far and you can't do it anymore, so then you have to go back one, and then you kind of find your your sweet spot. But it's not necessarily the case. It's entirely possible you can be a good defensive coordinator and an even better head coach because you're, you're doing different things. So leaving aside the part where Washington had one of the worst defenses in the entire NFL, let's just leave, leave that to the side. The fact is, he has not been running a particular scheme and been the head and, and sole control of a defense in a very long time, the NFL has wildly passed whatever it is he was running back in 2010. And I just don't know he's the best man for the job. I don't even know if he was the best man for the job back in 2010. I have no idea. He probably was. He got a head coaching job. 
but I'm not even going to bother to look it up because it's irrelevant to me. How good he was with the San Diego Chargers from 2008 to 2010 is so wildly irrelevant to me. It's just, it's not even worth talking about. He's also DC for the Chicago Bears 2004, 5, and 6. I'm sure that was a good unit uh, because it's the Bears, and I'm sure he got a lot of credit for that. I mean, he, by the way, he's a Bears guy. He was a Bears player, got his first job with the Bears uh, as a de- defensive quality control coach. First defensive coordinator job was with the Bears. He was also played for the Bears in college for the Cal Golden Bears. So he's a bear through and through. But I, I just, I don't have interest in that. I don't, I mean, it, it's like Mike Pettin, but significantly worse. Mike Pettin at least was a good defensive coordinator not too long ago, right? He was a consultant. And then before that, he was a failed head coach. And then before that, he was a successful defensive coordinator. And even that, apparently the gap was too big for him to be able to come back and still be that dude. Just no way. Bottom line is no way. I I have zero, less than zero interest in Ron Rivera. The days of, you know, we need Mike Pettin because Matt LaFleur doesn't have head coaching experience and he can kind of help him with that. Those, Those days are long gone. He does not need help head coaching experience. He just needs a guy to run the defense. He needs a guy that he doesn't need to babysit in the defensive coordinator room. But that doesn't mean he needs a an, an, uh, freaking antique that doesn't know how to do the job very well. Um, next on this list is Chris Harris, another former player, another guy that got to start with the Chicago Bears, both as a player and as a coach. Uh, another guy that's a safety is a lot of DBs, a lot of former DBs and DB coaches that are, that are in the, uh, the crosshairs here, which I don't hate. Maybe it's just because we're not used to it and it's a different thing. It would be kind of different to have a a safety in there and you kind of get excited about the safeties and then you don't care when the defense doesn't work. I don't know. But I, I think it's kind of cool. But he played for the Bears, the Panthers, the Bears again, and the Lions and the Jaguars. As a coach, he was a quality control guy for the Bears 2013-14. Assistant defensive backs coach uh, for the Chargers. Then he was a DB coach for Washington. And then um, 2023 defensive pass game coordinator and cornerbacks coach. Obviously, there's a lot of turnover in Tennessee. That's why there's a good amount of Titans probably on this list. And I'm sure a lot of guys just looking to get that Ron Rivera, or not Ron Rivera, the uh, Mike Vrabel magic is probably what that is. And for that reason, we might as well lump them together. You got Chris Harris, defensive pass game coordinator slash cornerbacks coach for the Titans. Terrell Williams, assistant head coach slash defensive line coach. So again, you get that assistant head coach guy. Uh, Shane Bowen, former DC for the Titans, just go straight to the top. Uh, I think that's it. But I, I don't have a lot to say about really any of these guys. I mean, I I don't know the last time Tennessee had a a truly dominant defense. It looks like via DVOA, I can only go back to 2021. And in 2021, they had the 10th ranked defense, and that's the best defense they've had in the last three years. So I don't know if this is just, you know, uh, Vrabel left and everybody's just getting a bunch of phone calls. As far as I know, by the way, I don't think uh, Chris Harris, I believe, is still there. So they're, they're just being allowed to interview. They haven't been fired or anything else. But I just, I don't have a lot to go on with him. He checks the former player box, 41 years old, um, good culture under Vrabel. But again, it's it's one thing to work under a guy who's a good head coach, right? He's, he's acknowledged as a good head coach. I think that's what Vrabel was. But that doesn't mean necessarily that everybody under him is going to be able to do what Vrabel did. Because it's not just a scheme thing. It's a head coaching thing. And we're not hiring a head coach. We need a defensive coordinator. So I just, I you know... I'm not saying he's bad. I just, I, there's nothing that gets me excited here. You know, from a schematic standpoint, not that I would necessarily know a ton, but I think you're, it's, it's still 3 4. I think it's predominantly a little bit more true 3 4 than what Barry does. Um, I think you're going to get more. I'm trying not to be too cliche because everybody's going to be, oh, it's all about pressure and it's all about coverage. And it's all, it's like, yeah, that's everybody. But, you know, again, I mean, Barry was all about pressure too, but really in reality, the linebackers, except down the stretch, they got a little bit more aggressive. Their primary job is to to stay where they are, to drop into coverage, that kind of stuff. I think you're going to see more of that linebackers and corners being used as blitzers. Um, there's going to be a little bit more man. I mean, it's 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 a zone and man thing like everybody else's, but it's not as zone quite as Joe Barry, but largely similar. So, I mean, it, it, it's kind of like dipping your toe in the water as opposed to going all in if you went with more of a, a Titans thing, which is, it's not just you know, four, it's not 4-3, which, you know, some people want to just, let's just go 4-3 for whatever reason. And like heavy man, heavy blitz. It's more like a little bit more man, a little bit more blitz, stay in 3-4 kind of deal. But um, the other uh, Titans guy we got is Terrell Williams. He is 49 years old, so still sub-50, 
which for me is kind of the cutoff between, you know, a more veteran guy and a little bit of a younger guy. He's in his 40s, but uh, started coaching defensive line in 1998 at Fort Scott. Cracked the NFL in 2012, so it's kind of a long road. He was in college for a long time. Went to the Oakland Raiders as a defensive line coach, so he's been D-line for forever. I mean, most of these guys, they bounce around. He was Fort Scott D-line, North Carolina D-line, Youngstown D-line, Akron D-line, Purdue D-line, Texas A&M D-line, Oakland Raiders D-line, Miami Dolphins D-line, Tennessee Titans D-line. The first time he's ever had a title that's different. Since 1998, assistant head coach slash defensive line. So I I don't know. I don't I don't know that I necessarily like that. I I would like a little. You know, there's some of these guys. I I forget. You know, one of the Ravens guys in particular, I think, had worked like every different job. You know, he did quality control. He was an intern, then quality control, then he did like some DB, and he did some run game. Like it was just it was like a guy that was grooming to be a defensive coordinator and then a head coach. Because you want that. I mean, at the end of the day, I, I love that he's a good defensive line coach. But if I want to hire a guy to be a defensive coordinator, it's not to say he can't do it, but I want him to be able to best utilize our corners and our safeties and our linebackers and our edge rushers just as well as the defensive line. And he's obviously a, a defensive line specialist, but it would just be nice to uh, have a little bit more of a well-rounded skill set, I guess. And he's also, you know, again, he's a little bit upper uh, upper end of the young, you know, yeah, he's actually going to turn 50 this year, but, and then on top of that, you know, not a former player. He was with, you know, again, Tennessee, which is, eh, as far as defense goes, he was with Miami. I can't remember the last time they had a good defense before that was Oakland, which was 2012, 2014. I'm not talking like the seventies back when they had a good defense. So I don't know. I, I again, the, maybe he'd be an elite defensive coordinator. I just, there's nothing here that gets me super jacked. And then there's the man himself, Shane Bowen and Shane Bowen, um, is, I believe, the defensive coordinator for the Tennessee Titans. Again, it sounds like he's being allowed to do interviews because he is doing interviews, but I believe as of right now, he's still considered the defensive coordinator for the Titans. If there is a big change, which, you know, obviously they're hiring a new head coach, it's entirely possible that uh, he could look for an entirely new staff, which is probably more than possible. It's probably likely. Um, There's a possibility that there could be a lateral move. But again, he's been there since 2021. His best year was his first year there, which probably means he inherited a pretty decent unit and it's gotten worse every every year. I don't know, man. I mean, he, he does seem to be a really fast riser. It's very strange. He's not a former player. The first thing I see listed here was he was a, so he is 37. So he's very young, very fast rising, which is all great. Uh, student assistant at Georgia Tech in 2009. He got his first coaching gig at Kennesaw State as a linebackers coach in 2013 was a defensive assistant for the Houston Texans, 2016-17, Tennessee Titans outside linebackers coach, 2018 through 2020, and then defensive coordinator. So, I mean, really, really insanely fast riser. Um, It looks like he actually might have been a player. He's not listed here as, as having played at all, but I think in college maybe he played a little bit and then had an injury. But, I mean, this dude is, he's the same age as me. He looks older than me. He's he's all grizzled up and everything else, but he is he's we're the same age. In fact, he is a week younger than me. <laughs> Which is sad to say. So, I mean, for that reason, I would say that it's definitely intriguing. Um and it looks like he was uh coaching in 2018, which would have been a little bit of overlap there with Matt LaFleur. So there is some familiarity. It's just it's just tough. But again, Matt LaFleur was there in Tennessee. I wasn't massively impressed with the numbers, but he was really talented and had an elite reputation. And so there you go. So maybe a little bit intrigued by Bowen, but not super jacked. Just, you know, again, 37 years old and just flew up the rankings, which is massively intriguing in and of itself, I guess. That brings us to Demarcus Covington. He is the um, defensive line coach for the New England Patriots. He is 34 years old, so even younger. Um, He was a grad assistant for a while, but got his first defensive line coach job at UT Martin in 2015. Then was... (laughs) Freaking man. Some of these guys, I mean, I I can't imagine how good of a reputation you must have. I know these are smaller schools, but it's still a big freaking deal to just jump into a job from from a graduate assistant to defensive line coach at UT Martin. And the next year he gets hired as co-defensive coordinator and defensive line coach for Eastern Illinois. And then after one year of that, so one year at UT Martin, 
one year at Eastern Illinois. He is a coaching assistant for the Patriots, does that for just two years, and gets promoted to outside linebackers coach. Then is the D-line coach. So again, I love this because he is on a fast track. You're also talking about Bill Belichick. That's where he cut his teeth, and that's the only place he's been. He was a coaching assistant, which again, I, I love when it's like he's a graduate assistant, and he has some, some coaching experience, and then he comes in as a coaching assistant, really just learning the details, and then he does two different positions. Now, maybe he needs a little bit more time to grow, but I love the track that he's on. Dude is 34 years old. First time getting a coaching gig in the NFL was in 2019 was given to him by Bill Belichick, and then after one year got a promotion. And, and that's, that's the thing that's crazy. He, he, was, he had a coaching job for one year, got, a, got hired by a different school as a co-defensive coordinator. The Patriots pick him up. They coach him up for three years. Then they give him a coaching job. He does that for one year, gets a promotion. Been the defensive line coach for the Patriots for three years, and now is getting calls to be a defensive coordinator. And who knows how many times he's had calls in the past. And again, maybe it's too early. I don't know, but that's pretty wild, man. Uh, as far as being a former player, he did play a little bit in college. Interestingly enough, wide receiver. Now, this would be a much more divergent path as far as defense is concerned when you're talking about Bill Belichick's scheme as opposed to like the Titans, which, as I said, is maybe a little bit more of a minor adjustment. But again, you're kind of looking at like a Flores type of deal, right? That's that whole coaching tree. You get the, the hybrid defensive line, you know, instead of like the Ben, don't break, preventing big plays, play it safe thing. You've got absolutely obliterate their strengths as your defensive philosophy and exploiting weaknesses, right? It's, it's attacking. We're going to wipe that out and we're going to attack your weaknesses. Um, much more, you know, intricate pass rush. Pretty much everybody's more intricate pass rush than Joe Barry, where it's primarily what? Front four, right? But again, this is, this, it's a much more complicated, you know, let's let's find ways of generating pressure based on what we have and what their weaknesses are. And again, scheme scheme is largely the same. Joe Barry, a lot of zone. Bill Belichick, probably a lot more man. But also, it's just we're going to do what we have to do to make sure we neutralize what it is you're going to try to do. And so, you know, it's it's interesting because we always talk about like it's obviously what every defensive coordinator needs to do to be able to adapt, right? To be adaptable. But in reality, I think Joe Barry's philosophy is much more in tune to let's lean on the scheme, whereas I think genuinely Bill Belichick, and I, I wouldn't even necessarily call it a scheme, but as much as a, a way of playing and a way of coaching that, that I'm sure he passed down to everybody else, that is genuinely built on crafting from the ground up based on the guys that you have and based on your opponent. Again, we, we assume everybody does that, and, and to some degree you're always supposed to. But I just don't think Bill Belichick, or excuse me, um, I don't think Joe Barry was necessarily, not only was do I think he was not necessarily the best at that, but I also think he, he more or less brought the playbook along with him and said, this is how we run the scheme. So then you guys need to learn this and then we'll go run this and I'll call some plays out of this book and that's going to be the end of it. Well, we, we brought in this guy. So uh, how do you want to change? Like, we're, we're not changing it. This is This is the scheme and this is what we run. So, yeah, DeMarcus Covington is definitely intriguing. Again, is he too young? Maybe, but I, I just love seeing that. I love, especially in a respected place like, you know, um, New England, where you got a guy that gets handpicked, barely any experience, right? UT Martin, and then one year at Eastern Illinois, and the Patriots pluck him out of there and, like, make him their own little project as a coaching assistant. And then they give him a job, and after one year, he gets a he gets a promotion. That's that's from remarkable stuff. And at 34 years old, he's getting interviews as a defensive coordinator. <laughs> I'm really depressed by how everybody is exactly my age. <laughs> a guy that is uh, two months uh, older than me, Michael Hodges, linebackers coach for the Saints. Another guy that spent a little bit of time as a college football player at Air Force. Uh, went to uh, Texas, Texas A and M. Et cetera, et cetera. But primarily has been coaching. Again, young guy. 2011 was a strength and conditioning assistant at Texas A&M, a grad assistant at Fresno State, then a linebackers coach at Eastern Illinois. That was 2014 to 2015. Is there overlap from the other guy, Eastern Illinois? That'd be interesting to find out. And then 2016, co-defensive coordinator and safeties coach. Was he the other co-defensive coordinator? He is. That's crazy. So DeMarcus Covington was co-defensive coordinator and defensive line coach at Eastern Illinois. Michael Hodges 
was co-defensive coordinator and safeties coach at Eastern Illinois in 2016. So these guys were co-defensive coordinators together. And then Demarcus Covington went to New England that next year. He went on to the Saints the next year. Dude, Eastern Illinois must have kicked the crap out of people or something. Holy jeez. But he was a defensive assistant. Basically the same thing. He was listed as a, DeMarcus was a coaching assistant. Uh, Michael Hodges is a defensive assistant for the Saints. And it was the same thing. Like they groomed the guy, 27. So it was just two years. Then he was the assistant linebackers coach for one year and then got promoted to linebackers coach. So it's very similar. I mean, he spent a couple more years doing things, but you got strength and conditioning for a year, grad assistant for two years, linebackers coach for two years, co-defensive coordinator for a year, gets picked up by the Saints. He's a assistant, does his two years, you know, kind of learning as an assistant. One year as an assistant linebackers coach, gets promoted the very next year to linebackers coach and has been doing that for uh, for three years, just like DeMarcus has been the defensive line coach for three years since 2020. Incredible overlap between these two. I mean, the, the, the complication here is it's hard to pin down, like, what, what, what would you be getting as far as defense is concerned? Um, because there's been so much turnover for the New Orleans Saints. I mean, he showed up in 2020. Defensive coordinator was Dennis Allen. Um, and then in 2022, it was Ryan Nielsen and Chris Rich- Richard, and then 2023, Joe Woods. So I don't know. Maybe they're all very similar. I don't really care enough to look it up right now, but again, we can dive in more if the guy gets an interview or something, but um, that is that is kind of an interesting situation with Michael Hodges and Demarcus Covington and the, the paths that they were on and how they diverged and have like reconvened. Very, very crazy. Then you have Tem Lukabu. Interesting story in that uh, he is 42 years old, but he's from the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. Looks like, again, he played a little bit of college football, but not much, but uh, started off uh, Director of Player Development at Rutgers 2006-2007. I've never seen that before. That's a different starting starting point. But uh, linebackers coach for Rhode Island, then outside linebackers coach for Rutgers, and then defensive assistant for Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So again, you got the assistant things. I'm, I'm guessing this is sort of a, hey, I want to be a coach position you take in the NFL. Does it for two years. Goes back to college for linebackers coach, then defensive line coach. And then back to the NFL, San Francisco 49ers defensive quality control coach, which another good path if, you don't, if you're not going the defensive assistant route is the quality control. You're doing a lot of you know breaking down information. Then again, back to college, linebackers coach, and then linebackers coach for Cincinnati Bengals. So he finally got his first coaching gig in the NFL 2019 for the Bengals at, with the linebackers. Then he goes back defensive coordinator. So he's just weaving. Was the Boston College defensive coordinator for 2020, 2021, and 2022. And then 2023 outside linebackers coach for Carolina. So that's that's essentially why he's on the radar, right? This is this is the next iteration. But I I, I think it's hard to tell because, you know, I don't I don't know. And and guys go through so many different schemes and so many different things. I mean, this is kind of the things I learned when when looking up uh, Jim Leonard is there's so many different influences. But I I think if you had to pin down what a Tem Lukabu hallmark is, it's pass rush, right? He's a linebacker guy. He became an outside linebacker guy. And when he was at Boston College, I think one of the hallmarks was Gener- finding ways to generate pressure from your front seven, whether that's your interior linebackers, you know, utilizing multiple fronts, four, three, three, four, stunts and twists, all this different kind of stuff. I, I think that would be sort of the front seven disruption would be sort of the hallmark. And I have no issue with that. And then again, w- one of the, the differences to pay attention to with Tem Lukabu would probably be the fact that he started off with director of player development which is not necessarily a bad thing, since player development is kind of what this is all about. After that, you got Christian Parker, DB coach for the Denver Broncos. Um, Another really, I mean, probably our youngest so far. He's actually 32 years old. Dude was born in 91. Good Lord. Um, He actually did spend a lot of time in Green Bay, 2019 through 2020. So he's already got familiarity with the Packers, um, which could be very interesting. Again, it might be a little too early. But kind of a cool deal. So he was the DB coach for Virginia State, then DB coach for Norfolk State, then defensive analyst for Notre Dame, defensive analyst for Texas A&M. His first break in the NFL comes by Matt LaFleur, 
or Patton, I guess. I don't know, whatever. But he gets plucked out of the college ranks to be a defensive quality control coach, which again is sort of learning the ins and outs and breaking down a ton of different things. Mike Pettin's got him in there breaking down your opponents and and learning all these different things. He does that for two years and gets hired away by the Broncos for his first coaching gig to be the defensive backs coach. Now, again, is it too early? Probably. But he's he's getting interviews. And uh, if you're looking for a fast riser, he's probably somebody to keep an eye on maybe in a few years. But the Packers ties are definitely interesting. And again, if nothing else, a potential return for something else. You know, would he be interested in in taking a job? I mean, it's it's hard to go up from defensive backs coach, but maybe he wants a different job, trying to round out that experience a little bit. Don't know. Derek Ansley, 10 years older, but still a pretty young coach at 42 years old. Again, a lot of DB coaches. He's another one. He got his uh, first crack 2005 DB coach for Huntingdon. Not Huntington, but Huntingdon. Uh, Grad assistant at Alabama, then DB coach for Tennessee, DB coach for Kentucky. DB coach for Alabama, then gets his first crack at the NFL, DB coach for the Oakland Raiders, and then defensive coordinator and defensive backs coach for Tennessee, 2019-2020, defensive backs coach for the Chargers, and then defensive coordinator for the Chargers 2023 to present. Now, several issues arise here. The one glaring one is when you're the defensive coordinator of a team like the Chargers, that's not going to be great on your resume. Number two is the guy's never been anything other than a defensive backs coach. Again, personally, I like a little bit more versatility because it's like, okay, you've proved you're, you're good at like the one thing, working with DBs, right? But what else? I mean, he, he was defensive coordinator, right? At Tennessee, in college, no idea how good they were for those two years. But, you know, your one crack at the Chargers DC job did not go very well. Maybe that's not your fault. I don't know. I just, again, I'm, I'm just, eh, I'm not seeing it. Almost done. Bobby Babich, 40 years old, Kent State grad assistant, secondary coach at Eastern Illinois. Man, that is just a breeding ground there. Administrative assistant for the coaching staff, so he was a secretary for the Carolina Panthers. Interesting. Then defensive assistant for the Carolina Panthers, assistant DB coach for the Browns, then assistant secondary safeties coach for the Browns, then went back to FIU for a year, was the secondary coach slash defensive pass game coordinator. Then he goes on to the Buffalo Bills assistant defensive backs coach. Then after the one year is the safeties coach, does that 2018 through 2021, and then is the linebackers coach. So, I mean, that's kind of interesting that he did make the jump. He's been doing secondary stuff slash safety stuff, defensive pass game stuff, and then gets moved to linebackers. Been doing that for two years. But first of all, the one thing that stands out is Buffalo has had some level of success. Maybe not as much in 2023, but in 2022, according to DVOA, They were the number two defense. I think in 2021, they were the number one defense. So they've had some strong defenses. Now, one thing to know that is probably relevant, maybe it shouldn't be, I don't know, but Bobby Babich has a dad by the name of Bob Babich. Bob Babich was on the Bills staff when they hired Bobby Babich. So there might be some level of nepotism there, but he's going through all the proper channels to try to get there. It's just It's a question of would he have been given the opportunities had it not been for his dad? And is that the direction you want to go? Um, Trying to understand the Buffalo Bills scheme, by the way, under uh, McDermott and Frazier, it's kind of funny because it it sounds to me like the 4-3 version of what Joe Barry does. Not that that has to be a bad thing. I think we need to separate out Joe Barry's scheme and Joe Barry, which is to say you can have somebody run the exact same scheme and be very, very good at it. But it is funny as I kind of try to read up on it a little bit. So it's an option, not my favorite option. Two more. We got Anthony Campanile, currently linebackers coach for the Miami Dolphins. Um, He is 41 years old, got his start as a linebackers coach at Fairlawn High School. Wow, great. Then went to Don Bosco Prep, eventually got into Rutgers as a defensive assistant 2012-2013, then went to tight ends coach. Very interesting. Then wide receivers coach. Then went to defensive backs coach at Boston College. That was in 2016. And then Boston College co-defensive coordinator slash DB coach in 2018. Then was the Michigan linebackers coach in 2019. Then linebackers coach for the Miami Dolphins in 2020. So it's, it's, it really is shocking to me how quickly people rise through the ranks here. The guy went from wide receivers coach at Rutgers in 2015 to linebackers coach for the Miami Dolphins in 2020. Like he, he, he had his first DB job at Boston College in 2016. 
Two years later, he's a co-defensive coordinator. Bro, how do you just get started as a DB coach and two years later you're a defensive coordinator at Boston College? I, I, I don't understand this. Like, there, there are people that are just freaking geniuses, I guess. I, I, don't, I don't know. Then again, he goes to Michigan, spends one year there before getting plucked away to Miami. Now, I, again, I'd be a little bit nervous just because of the very limited experience. I mean, he did start off with defense before going a little bit to offense and then switching back, so I, I whatever. But it's like the, the guy has spent three years as a linebacker's coach at Miami, and that's it as far as the NFL is concerned. That, that somewhat worries me. And then on the very far end of the spectrum, the final person is Mike Caldwell. 52 years old, he was playing linebacker for the Cleveland Browns back in 1993. Also played for the Ravens, the Cardinals, the Eagles, the Bears, and the Panthers. Got his first gig as a defensive quality control coach in 2008. Assistant linebackers coach for the Eagles in 2010. Linebackers coach for the Eagles. Then inside linebackers for the Cardinals. Assistant head coach and inside linebackers coach for the Jets for 2015 through 18. Inside linebackers for the Bucks, and then finally defensive coordinator for the Jacksonville Jaguars the last two years. So I, I will say, I mean, even this guy would be relatively young at 52 years old, just getting his first coaching gig in 2008 and getting his first DC job in 2022. But the fact of the matter is, look at how many guys we've been through where Mike Caldwell is old, right? But compared to these 30 and 40 year old guys, Mike Caldwell is old, and he's relatively young, but, you know, it's kind of a question of, are you content with what you've gotten from Jacksonville? And this year, they ranked 10th via DVOA. So it's similar to Joe Barry in that the guys had three, well, actually, it's only two years. So, eh, I don't know. I guess if you look at it from that standpoint, they went from 23rd to 10th. That's actually pretty impressive. And again, like most of these guys, if you're looking at sort of the, the scheme, it's more variability, you're going to see more man, heavier mix of blitz packages, et cetera, et cetera. Bottom line is, from what I can tell, as far as the differences, Joe Barry was very vanilla. Three, four, you know, zone, get home with your front, end of story, right? Ben, don't break, you know, don't, don't allow the deep passes. Most other defensive coordinators, it's just, it's more complex than that. Mike Caldwell would be the same. So anyways, that is the list that I have. We'll continue to add to that as we go along. And if there's any other interesting names that you'd be interested in, I do want to kind of revert back to Jim Leonard again, just because I'm, I'm honestly, I get asked about him so often. I know that at the end of it, I wasn't a huge fan, uh, but I don't remember why. So I do want to kind of dig back into that, but I think we've covered enough guys for today. Um, and uh, I, I, you know, I, I, honestly, I really like this. I like going through guys' histories. I like kind of seeing their paths and their trajectories, which is really cool to look at. I think it's a lot more fun than what a lot of other people are out there doing, which is just, you know, I don't, I don't even know what people are doing. Just big names and, uh, you know, pluck a guy from a good defense or something. I don't know. Not that any of us can adequately answer the question, but I just think that this is a more comprehensive and fun way of going about the question. But anyways, I got to get out of here. You guys have a good rest of your day. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.